Hello, everybody from all over the world, wherever you're watching. We are so excited to be with you all uh, from wherever you are and whatever time zone you are in. My wife and I are actually back in Manila. And unfortunately, I am quarantined separate from her, which is why we're on two different screens. But we will engage you and have some fun as we learn together nonetheless. Let's get started with some polls as people are signing up. Uh, we have a couple of polls to help engage you and get to know you better. So we'd like to ask the team to please pop up those polls. Here we go. Let's find out who is joining us right now. Okay, if you see on your screens, we're asking questions like, you know, tell us how young you are or how wise you are, right? Tell us your age profile, your bracket. Tell us also, please, what is your background in terms of profession? We'd like to get to know you so that Family First Global Moving Forward can help address you and your needs where you're at and get to know you uh, even as we have this webinar with you, please also put in, in the poll, your family situation, your marriage status. Um, and we want to ask some money questions because this will be a webinar on finances. If you saw the graphic about financial storms and challenges and how we can, can help navigate through these things. Uh, so as you are answering the polls, we are seeing the results and joy, honey, it looks like similar to last time, we have a lot of young, young folks here right? Young folks, meaning we have those that are in there 26 to 35 is our, well, it's fluctuating right now. It looks like it's catching up. It's getting very close to the 36 to 50 year old brackets. And as far as the profession, we are seeing mostly people who are working for a company as well as either business owners or self-employed. That is great. Thank you for giving us this information. And we do have a substantial number of stay-at-home parents, 15% so far. Uh, as far as married status, just to let you know who is with you in this webinar, we're seeing most, a whopping majority, 85% are actually married. There are some singles here and a few widows. And then as far as, and, and I want to encourage all of you in the, in, that are taking this poll, these are anonymous answers, so we will not see your names. So we want you to be as honest as possible. And if you remember that age old expression, honesty is the best policy. We want you to please be honest with the questions on finances so that once again, we can better address you and your needs. So we're seeing that majority have a family budget. That's great, 75%. And, and people are honest enough in saying that, yes, a majority also have debt. Uh, as of this tally, it's 58%. And... People are also honest in saying that almost half, 46% have had some conflict or tension or stress when it comes to money with their spouses, their respective spouse. So thank you for being honest. Please, please keep filling out the polls. Now, Joy, honey, as uh, we're filling out these polls and waiting for people to, to flood this webinar and join us, let's be real with them. Uh, let's talk about financial storms and how this, this applies even in, in our own family dynamic, uh, very recent, as, as you and I were talking even before we started this webinar. Yeah, because we just got home from the US, right? And we were expecting everything to function well as we arrived, but certain things were breaking down the home that will involve costs. And these are, I think it's emblematic of our times. Like we can't always control what's happening around us, but we, we can control our perspective and our attitude and how we're gonna move forward. And so I was blessed by you, Han, you because you reminded me. Feeling, honestly? I was not feeling that way. I was irritated, but you reminded me, Han, you know, let's have a gratitude attitude. Let's be positive about this. And I'm just so thankful to be here because I wanna learn just like we did last time from all these experts, what a privilege for us to be part of this. Cause hun, we need to keep growing in this area. Wouldn't you agree? I, I totally agree. And you know, I, I, I am so excited to learn from them. And I think along with all the participants, you know, we are eagerly anticipating some answers because as you mentioned, it's a very real thing. You know, I, I did remember that quick conversation earlier where you were really upset. You're like, I can't believe these things are breaking down. You know, and there was this comparison, right? Like, why is it in the country we came from? Things were more efficient here. It's like, you know, and so as you were ranting away, I was like, how do I encourage my wife? You know, speaking of storms, you know, and, and even here at the place where I'm quarantining, all the things that I had to, to do here, 
had some costs that I was not prepared for buying the food, even just getting a glass of milk for breakfast this morning. I was like, I could not believe the price, you know? And so, so and the memes that are going around even right now, honey, right? About even the gas prices in the Philippines, where the Filipinos are saying these gas prices are the grades I wish I had when I was in school because they're in the 85.22, 92. So yes, it's a very real thing. The how to navigate through finances. And I love what you shared, how you know, really we want to be able to frame it with a gratitude attitude or frame it with the right perspective. And I, I'm hoping that we can do that uh, through the help of our amazing guests. So is there anything else you wanted to share about this team before we jump in and formally get started? Yeah, well, I just wanted to introduce like who's behind this because I think everyone needs to know that it's Family First Global who is the host for today's amazing webinar and FFG really exists to strengthen fathers and mothers, marriages and families around the world. This is a global event. It's a lot. There's a lot of diversity here. We can all learn from one another all around the world and they partner with like minded organizations to help men and women become better spouses and parents in the context of traditional marriage and family. So the Family First Global National Chapters from the Philippines, woohoo! And then there's of course Indonesia, Singapore, Pakistan, Japan, and Myanmar are also proud co-hosts of today's event. So if you are zooming in from any of these countries, feel free to get in touch with your chapters directly because they are there to help you out. Right, and, and as you're introducing the, the host behind this whole thing, we wanna remind everybody that even as you're joining the call right now and we're looking at the poll, let me just update everybody on who's on this call right now based on the polls. So there has been a, a shift in the age brackets. It seems like the majority, the whopping majority, 51%, are in the 36 to 50 year old. So I can imagine these are people with young children, fairly young, maybe those, some maybe older getting to the teens, but fairly young. Um, the profession seems to be at this point primarily people who are either employees or if you add the business owners and self-employed, that's about 56% now, 30, 40, it's fluctuating at 45. So that seems to be the, the dominant combination, if you will, a business owner, self-employed, self -employed, so you control your time. The married status jumped up even more significantly. 78% are married, um, although there is a growing number of singles here, 19, uh, close to 20%. So welcome to all of you. And I then... think we always appreciate the singles, right? Because, you know, we want a preventive approach to navigating yes. life. And so it's good yes. when singles are also on the call. Fantastic, right? Uh, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So yes, learn these principles. And hey, everybody has to deal with money, whether you're married with kids or as a single, right? So this is a great topic uh, for, for all of us here. Um, and then on the last questions about money, the honest answers of people. Do you have a family budget? 74%, good job, actually do. Uh, do you have debt? 55% have answered yes. And we will talk about that with our speakers here. And we, uh, we have as a final question, is this a source of tension? And there's still a very honest, almost equal number of people saying yes and no. So, you know, I don't know who's being honest there, but thank you for, for sharing that. And the good news is, once again, this is anonymous. And the better news is, that's what this webinar is really for. It's hopefully to give some perspective from the stories of amazing gentlemen who you will be meeting in a little bit. And I believe we are ready to go. So for those that have just joined us, uh, please continue to answer the polls and we will be able to use that data in being able to serve you better. In the meantime, let's get started. Joy has already introduced my wife, the Family First Global as the host. Let me now talk to you about this webinar. Family Health 360 is the theme, if you will, of this whole webinar, and it is a series of webinars. It's here to journey with you through the waves of uncertainty and prepare you for the challenges ahead. And as we join, I, my wife and I already opened up earlier, there are a lot of challenges going on right now. As we know, even as the pandemic is raging, there is also a war that is now ongoing. And I was just watching the news and catching up and realizing how, you know what, many of us are still fortunate to be in places where we can have the freedom to talk and have these discussions. So even as all of this is happening, part one was held back in January called Navigating Your Family Through the Pandemic. And now this part two, so we had a power-packed set of panelists back in part one, and I enjoyed the learning journey with you there, honey. In part two, it will be equally power-packed as well as we give you high-level insights 
on economic climate potential shifts, but more than this, proven practical tools and solutions that you can apply to your family and your business for those of you uh, in that space. Now to help us navigate through these financial storms, we have international business veterans who are also active community leaders who will partner with you and chart 2022 with confidence. Um, before we formally introduce them, I wanna make sure that we have a go signal from our team to actually proceed. All right, we do. Uh, all our tech is live, so you're watching us from either Facebook or, um, or the Zoom call. And again, a reminder that this is a webinar which will be videoed. And as it is videoed, you will receive the link to it afterwards, including the speaker's notes. So that just frees your hands up. But if you want to take screenshots, feel free to take it because there'll be a lot of great lines that you might be seeing on the screen. And Here's a very important question or an important reminder for all of us. Because this webinar is for you, we want you to ask, ask, ask your questions. And don't just wait until the end. Put them on the chat boxes in whichever platform you're using. And our team will call through these questions and we will try and address as many, because we can imagine there will be a lot, as many of the questions you pose. And we will bring it to our panelists and get them to answer it to the best of their ability. So once again, Sit back, relax, enjoy the webinar. You'll get a recording. You can't take screenshots, but also ask, ask, ask your question. Here we go. Let's now introduce the gentleman who has actually been the champion of this whole movement, if you will, the founder and chairman of Fellowship of Fathers Foundation and Family First Global. He is the global best-selling author of Be a Better Dad Today a teacher of leadership courses at some of the best and finest business schools in the world. And on a personal note, I consider him a mentor whom I look up to as well. Ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our panelists, starting with the first, let's please welcome Professor Gregory Slayton. Thank you so much, Edric, and thank you, Joy. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. I wanna greet everyone who's joined us tonight. And that's right, what Edric said is exactly right. This webinar is for you. And I tell my students everywhere, whether I'm teaching at Harvard or Dartmouth or Peking University, I tell them the same thing. It's not important what's taught. It's important what you learn. So let's be together. I've got my notes. I've got my paper. I'm going to learn a lot tonight. And I hope you will too. Things that we can really put into practice with our family. Our first speaker is a dear, dear friend of mine, one of my oldest friends, and a very successful businessman, but more importantly, a very successful husband and father and community leader. Mark Belton is the former uh, executive vice president for global strategy, growth, and marketing innovation at General Mills. General Mills is a huge company, Fortune 100 company here in the United States. Mark's also the founder and principal of Wise Fellow Consulting. In his 32-year career at General Mills, Mark became known as a champion for growth, innovation, and people. Mark earned his undergraduate degree in economics from Dartmouth College. Remember that college, you'll hear that again. And his MBA from the Wharton School of Business. He has 16 years of Fortune 500 corporate board experience. He also served as the vice chairman of the Salvation Army and other great nonprofits. Mark was named one of the corporate America's most powerful African-American executives by Fortune Magazine and Black Enterprise, and is one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company. Mark resides in Minneapolis with his wife, Alicia, and their wonderful children, Alexander and Gabriel. And most importantly, Mark is a great guy, and I'm honored that he's here with us tonight. We're going to learn a lot from him. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Well, Gregory, thank you. And I am humbled and honored to get a chance to speak to you all today. Um, this is no doubt a very difficult topic. Um, you know, when I think about the statistics, even in America, 70% of all Americans um, report struggling financially. And 51% of all Americans say they don't have three months of savings. And um, so when I started to think about this as a topic, I can tell you there's tons of materials out there, so you don't need that. You can get the materials. But I thought it might be better if I actually shared how I learned how to manage 
uh, money and how to deal with financial challenges. And, and I'll just start and say the way I learned was through my parents. They uh, grew up during the Great Depression in America. And um, they grew up with large family, large households. My father was one of nine, my mother was one of eight. They grew up in the deep South and they were dirt poor. They um, never had big jobs, never made big money. My father was a New York City policeman. My mom was a secretary. They never went to college. And uh, they fought and dealt with um, levels of discrimination that, you know, that frankly, I've never had to, um, to deal with. And um, they raised two kids who went to college and uh, became quite successful. And um, interestingly enough, last, uh, about a month ago, I took my mother back home to New York and she needed me to kind of sort out some of the financial things that she was uh, looking at and working on. And um, she's 94. And all I can tell you without divulging, you know, what she's been able to do over these years after my father passed, but I will tell you that she is and has been now able to have an inheritance for her children's children. So for literally her grandchildren, she saved enough to have an inheritance for them. If you wonder about their credentials, I will tell you that there's nothing in the last hundred years like the Great Depression. You know, it was a 10 year period of economic upheaval, um, primarily starting first in the United States, but it affected every country in the world. There was a decline in production. There was a level of severe unemployment and there was acute levels of deflation. It impacted every country in the world and um, some people, um, you know, as you kind of study about it, said that this was a time of extreme human suffering. In fact, one person wrote that this was the most severe and longest depression in the Western world in recorded history. Well, that's what my parents grew up with and that's what they grew up in. So today I'm just gonna to try to talk to you about two things. First is what did I actually learn from them and how can you put that into practice for yourself and then the second question I want to ta uh, talk to today is also around what have I learned from them about life? Because I can tell you, we lived and grew up with sometimes very little and sometimes a little more, but never a lot. But we had what mattered. And I think those things are really important to discuss, you know, as we're, as we're talking today. I can tell you right now, um, the simplicity of, of what they taught me. You don't need a degree from the National Institute of Singapore. You don't need a degree from Hong Kong University or from KAIST in South, South Korea. These things are straight ahead. It's not usually about what you know, it's about what you do with what you know. So why don't we move to my slide and we'll go to the first one and talk about what my parents taught me. First and foremost, the first thing that they taught me is making money is not creating wealth. There are people who make lots of money, save none, and they, as a result, have no new wealth in their lives. They taught me that you need to basically spend less than you make. That's not difficult to understand. Yet, as I already told you, 51% of Americans don't have three months of savings. They're spending everything that they have. 70% of Americans are struggling. It was great to see in the statistics um, on this poll that you all all um, say that you have a budget. I can guarantee you that number is not that high in reality. My parents taught me to pay yourself first. And so what that meant to them was that you had to create a goal to save each and every month. And because my parents were part of that Great Depression and they literally were starving at times in their lives, they literally banked one salary every month. Let me say that again. They banked a salary every month, i.e. they took what came in on both of the incomes that they had and took one and put it away because they never wanted to have that happen again. Um, easy things to look at and talk about, like avoiding unnecessary debt. You know, there is debt that is good. You know, debt for a house, even debt 
and an investment in yourself for going to school, going to college and the like. You know, that's necessary debt because the best investment you can make in your life is to invest in yourself. But they avoided unnecessary debt, which meant we didn't have, you know, we didn't have a lot of cars and the cars were never new. Um, the other thing they taught me was to invest only in things you understand. You know, there are so many complicated financial investments and instruments out there. Very few people understand them. And as a result, people often get themselves in a situation where the complexity of what they've invested in um, actually robs them of the income and the savings that they have. And then the last one, I think, is probably the most important thing, which is to get agreement, you know, with your spouse, with your wife on the plan that you had. Now, interesting for those two, because they both grew up in the same era, because they both went through the same hardship, they never had to argue about wanting to save or wanting to make sure that they were ready for a rainy day. But I think it's fundamentally important to have a plan where everyone can align and then get agreement and then go forth and do it. The second thing they taught me is that your spending, the way you spend money reflects the values that you have. It reveals who you are. And I, I will tell you, if you look at how you spent your money over the last year, it will tell a lot about the type of person you are. Are you a person who's generous? Are you a person who spends on what I might call less than necessary things? Are you putting money away for the future? Are you getting, are you saving and preparing now for your children's um, academic education? It tells a lot about who you are and how you, how you spend actually reveals your heart. And um, the other thing I'd say is that once you've taken a look at that, adjust it. Base what you want to do on your priorities. Don't be cavalier and don't be casual about how you spend the money that you have. Spend it based on priorities. Spend it based on things that matter to you. Next slide. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So the second uh, thing I just want to talk to you a little bit about is just, you know, what really matters in life. Um, you can have a lot, you can have a little, but I can tell you that a person's joy and happiness very often does not coincide with what they have. It coincides with who they are and how they live. And so I just put this one quote up so that you all could take a look at it today. And it says, what does it profit a man if he shall gain the world and lose his own soul? I'll let that just sink in. So there were four things that we learned and grew up with as a family. The first one was to be people of faith. And to me, faith gives substance to this life. It's, it's the anchor and the rock that we, in our household, we spend our life upon. And I just got one quick quote here for you, which is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything will be added to you. But you have to take that in by faith. The second thing that I think helps contribute this idea of living a life that matters is to have a sense of purpose. And first and foremost, we are uniquely divinely created beings. And we, because we're here, we matter fundamentally. But because we're here, we have a role as well to play. And, uh, and I've always viewed that as to use our gifts and talents for the glory of God and for the good of man. We're here to contribute to mankind, to, bring, to create a just and wonderful uh, society for each and every person. And we're to use our gifts in that way. And that type of purpose gives you a sense of joy. It gives you a sense of meaning. And I found that that was so important in the things I did in the workplace. You know, we didn't just sell food at General Mills. We actually helped feed the world. We nourished people's lives. And that's a high and noble purpose. And I think when you are doing things that give you that sense of a high purpose, I think it gives you a level of joy each and every day. Next one, family. Um, I always call it first, you start with honoring your father and mother in the way that you live your life. And, um, and I think this is a really important idea below, which is below, and it's just in quotes. It says that family is the center 
of God's plan for happiness and the progress of his children. So I can tell you, if your family is not happy, you're not going to be happy because your family is the center of the plan for happiness in this world and the progress of his children. And then finally, community. And uh, I just have one phrase there. Um, the idea is to live in harmony with one another. And uh, there's a great scripture in the Bible which says, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And we're living in a world right now where things aren't quite that harmonious. We need to do this. We need to get back and start to think about the things that bind us together, um, one to another, and in harmony with one another. So with that, I'm going to step myself out of the way. Um, again, I never said this was rocket science, but I can tell you it's not, as Greg said earlier in his start, you know, it's not what you're taught, it's what you learn. And I'll add, it's not only what you learn, but what you do. So it's in the doing that makes the difference. So I'll receive questions if you have them. Yeah, thank you so much. That was so inspiring. You know, we have six kids and I wish I was beside Edric right now so I could nudge him on all those points and be like, babe, we got to apply all of this. <laughs> but, you know, I think nudge. I felt the nudge. I felt. Yeah, <laughs> That's, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you know, a lot of us, when you were sharing these principles, I think we know it in our heads. Right. And we we even believe in these principles. Why do you think like from your observation of people and their behavior, why do you think it's so difficult to transition from knowing about these things and knowing the right thing to do to actual application and transformation in our own lives? Yeah, you know, that's a wonderful question. I think um, part of the challenge is first, we live in such a busy society. We're always on the go. And as a result, I don't think we take a lot of time to actually reflect and think about where we are, um, what we're doing, and, um, and where are we going. So number one, we're moving really fast, frankly, almost as chickens with our heads cut off most of the time. And we don't take time for reflection. I think the second thing is it's hard to do because many of us are driven by, you know, status, um, other values that are contrary to the four values that I had up on that table, where you feel like you need that extra thing. Um, you know, that one watch is good, but five or four or five would be better. And, um, and as a result, we're always in tension between, you know, what we know and what we like versus what's really important. That's a great question, though. Thank you, Mr. Belton. Um, you know, before I, I jump in, I have like 100 billion questions for you right now, but I'm sure the audience does as well. So if we can just encourage everybody that's just joined us, maybe those that have heard this, please put in your questions here on the chat box in the platform you're using, because again, this webinar is for you and we'd love to hear questions. Um, but I'm gonna jump in with a question as well. Uh, Mr. Belton, you know, if there's a, someone in the audience here who wants to work for General Mills, can they go through you? I'm just kidding. That's not my question at all. <laughs> no, my main question is, uh, we saw from the poll earlier that um, uh, almost half of the participants have been honest in saying that money has been a source of conflict in their marriage as husband and wife. And one of the key principles you just shared that you learned from your parents is you need to make sure that you get agreement with your spouse on financial plans. So my question is, what if you don't? As we've heard from the participants, there's conflict. What if the spouse does not want to agree? And that is the source of conflict uh, is the way that they handle the financial plans. What is your advice then? Number one, that means that you need to spend more time together talking about what your goals and your dreams are. And you need to put those together together. You need to work on them together. You have to take the time to be sure where you're trying to go as a couple and where you're trying to take your family. And if you spend the time on that, I think you've got a much better chance to actually execute it if both people are talking and both people feel they own it. You know, that, that's the other part of it. If one person's doing all the talking, then one person owns it. Um, but you have to really work together on that. Fantastic. Um, and I know we have, uh, like I said, so many more questions for you, Mr. Bell, but we'll pause that and we'll ask people to put it on the chat box and we will now go to our next speaker. So please hang in there. Uh, we will address more of your questions and Mr. Belton, I'm excited to ask more from ourselves and from the audience. In the meantime, we'll bring back once again, 
the, the champion and the mover for Family First Global, Professor Slayton, who will introduce our next guest. Thank you. You're on mute, Professor Slayton. All right. Thanks, Edric, and thanks, Mark. That was great. Uh, always learn. I, I've, I've known Mark for 40 years. Every time I listen to him, I'm learning something good, and that's great. Uh, Glenn Yu is a dear, dear friend, and anyone who's from the Philippines knows Glenn because of his great work at Sea Oil Philippines, the largest independent fuel company in the Philippines. But what I, where Glenn was CEO for many years, is still the chairman. But what I find fascinating about Glenn is, first of all, he's a very humble guy. And you know, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's something the Bible tells us over and over again. And we really see that in Glenn. And second of all, I love his family story about how his grandfather founded the business, passed it on to his dad, passed it on to Glenn, but not just the business the values, the ethics, the morals that made a great business. We're going to hear a lot from Glenn. Uh, Glenn not only has been a very successful businessman, he's got a wonderful family, wonderful wife, wonderful kids. He's also the president of Family First Philippines, Familia Muna Filipinas, uh, which, is the, which is the Philippines chapter of uh, Family First Global. And they have done a fantastic job, one of our strongest nations uh, Family First Philippines is one of the strongest Family First Global Nations. They've been helping literally hundreds of thousands of families, you know, indirectly and just wonderful. Uh, so uh, Glenn holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of British Columbia and is uh, just, I'm just honored to, to know him and call him my friend. Glenn, we're excited to hear from you, brother. Over to you. Hey, thanks, Brother Gregory, and good morning, everyone. So we live in an increasingly VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, increasing in complexity, and more ambiguous. Like it or not, we live in a cycle of boom and bust as reflected in the global stock market. It's part of life. You know, in the last 100 years, as the slide shows, there's been about 13 U.S. stock market crashes. 14, if we include the, the latest one in uh, involving the Ukraine and Russia conflict. And of the 14, eight um, of those, more than 50% have happened in the last 25 years. So they're no longer few and far between. They're happening more frequently and increasing in intensity. So financial storms have been brought about by bubbles, war, and in recent times, pandemics. And we need to change our mindset um, and uh, ask perhaps uh, not the question of if they will happen, but when they will happen. And look at how um, we can proactively prepare for these difficult times. So today, I hope to share with you how these storms have shaped my own life and that of my family and how we've prepared for and dealt with them. In the chart, I've inserted two storms in the timeline. The first one is uh, the 1979 oil crisis. And the next one is the 1997 Asian financial crisis. So sharing a picture of me in 1979, I hope it doesn't traumatize any of you. Uh, and if my wife is uh, watching on live stream, uh, especially uh, my parents, actually were uh, gasoline station operators in 1967. So I grew up uh, uh, at the gas station and the Iranian revolution caused oil prices to spike, causing supply shortages and very long lineups at the pump. And uh, this is when uh, my mom and dad decided to put up an oil storage terminal. And uh, the business and industry that I'm involved in today was birthed in the midst of a crisis. People ask me how long I've been in the oil business and I tell them that I was born into it. So fast forward 18 years to the Asian financial crisis and the Philippine peso uh, dropped from 26 pesos per US dollar at the start of the crisis to 46.50 pesos in early 1998. 
to 53 pesos in 2001. And interest rates skyrocketed uh, overnight rates, reaching 32% that's right, 32% in 1997. So this was the backdrop of when I met my wife, Jack. Uh, in the US, um, as um, Mr. Belton mentioned, money arguments are uh, uh, quite uh, often uh, the leading cause of the, you know, stress and the anxiety between uh, husband and wife. And because of this, many single people decide to put life on pause during storms. But uh, can you believe it? Our love story started at the eye of the storm. And uh, we got married in uh, 2000 in the middle of the crisis. So with, with the recent spike in oil prices, there's plenty of memes. Um, Edric was mentioning uh, one uh, a while ago about bringing uh, uh, their grades up to the price of oil and uh, another meme is bringing their spouses to some place expensive and that's the gas station and we were doing that 25 years ago uh, i brought my wife um, then my girlfriend uh, jack to the gas station uh, i shared with her the financial struggles uh, to make debt and interest interest payments to our creditors to pay suppliers, to make payroll, and to collect overdue receivables from customers because of the crisis. And I told her that uh, this would be the life that we could expect in the near term if we chose to get married. And I can tell you 25 years later that we persevered, we made it through that storm, and the, the eight more storms that came after. So you may be wondering and asking yourself the, this question, and, uh, maybe uh, if you are in a financial storm right now, what do I do? It's very important that you communicate your concerns with your family, your spouse or girlfriend, so that they can help you do the following. One, you have to change your lifestyle. Uh, stop the bleeding. Second, you have to have a budget. Third is you can restructure your debt. And last, you can pivot and adapt to a new environment. So let's find uh, out uh, about each one in more detail. The first one is about changing your lifestyle. I like this quote by Dave Ramsey. He says, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. So if we are spending on things uh, that we don't need and are more uh, about once, then we need to face uh, the problem. We need to sell assets that are not essential. The golf share, the gas, the gas guzzling sports car or van, that gym membership uh, where we, that gym that we never go to. <laughs> so in our case, in order to make payroll in the business, we cut costs. Uh, we turned off the air conditioning even um, during the summertime when it was uh, the lunch break. And uh, instead of eating out for lunch, we would bring home-cooked meals to the office. We carpooled to work. We put off going on vacation. Uh, we did everything we could to stop the bleeding, the bleeding. Next is we restructured our debt. Uh, in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. So I get this question a lot. When are we in debt and not in debt? So we are not in debt if we are able to pay that uh, outstanding amount whenever it is due. And we find ourselves in debt when our liabilities exceed our assets and we don't have sufficient cash flow. And uh, last is that when we are in a constant state of anxiety, over money matters. So here are some things that you can do if you find yourself in debt. Number one, consider debt consolidation. Uh, so if you owe mul uh, multiple credit cards, it makes sense to take out a loan at the lower interest rate to pay off all your credit card debt. Second, work with your creditors. Don't hide from them. Ask them to reduce the interest or extend the pay-down period for the principal. 
And third is seek help through debt relief. If you need to, there's no shame in filing for bankruptcy. You know, Jack, after using her credit cards and spending more than she was able to, um, decided to literally cut it. Uh, did you know that not paying your outstanding balance in full on the day it is due is one of the most common mistakes that young couples make? And by paying the minimum each time and assuming an interest rate of about 15%, that it will take 169 months or 14 years to pay off the whole amount. By that time, you would have paid more interest uh, 1.4 pesos for every peso you borrowed from the credit card company. So whatever item you bought from your credit card would be long gone and you would still be paying for it. So next time you're tempted and I'm speaking from experience, remember it's not worth it. Third is rework your budget. Know where each and every peso is spent Know in advance if there is a shortfall so you can adjust spending accordingly. Um, and a simple way to do this is through envelope budgeting. So that system involves assigning categories to individual envelopes. Each one is allotted a certain amount of cash. You don't even need to have a bank account if you want to budget. And uh, it's used to cover spending for groceries, rent, gas, and you can prioritize expenses using the 50, 20, and 30 rule. 50% on your needs and debt obligations, and 20% on savings, and 30% on everything else. Uh, this includes, you know, eating out, going to a movie, or a short vacation. Um, our budget in the early years was 50, 20, <laughs> since there's no cash left in the envelope, for the 30. I like this quote by John Maxwell. He says, a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Here are just some additional pointers on budget, uh, budgeting. Number one, have the more financially savvy spouse manage the money. Number two, avoid misunderstanding uh, by uh, making sure that each uh, person, the husband or the wife, have transparency in their expenditures. Number three, set aside money for emergencies. In every family, there are always those times when things go wrong and emergencies occur. So by setting money aside and saving a portion of your income for the unexpected, uh, it helps a lot without messing up your budget or having to borrow money. So. I learned a lot from uh, Professor Gregory whenever he speaks and he always gives out assignments. So this is my assignment for you, for all of the participants on the Zoom today. Now, I want you to make a list of your spending that are wants and not needs and find out how much you are uh, spending each month and how much you can potentially save if you give them up. So here's a sample list. Um, you know, soft, anywhere from soft drinks, soda, coffee, junk food, movies, uh, and cigarettes, okay? And uh, here it's a little over 9,000. So do you know how much you save after 10 years or 25 years, assuming you invested the money you save in time deposit each month um, and earning uh, interest of 8%, uh, for example, in 10 years, you would be a millionaire in peso terms, 1.5 million. And in 25 years, you are a millionaire multiple times. So that's 8 million in 25 years. So let's just recap the four things you can do if you, if you find yourself in the midst of a storm. Change your lifestyle. Focus on needs and not wants. Restructure your debt. Credit card debt is the most expensive kind of debt. Rework your budget. Follow the uh, envelope budgeting, 50, 20, and if there's something left over, 30 uh, rule. And last is pivot and adapt to the new environment. So change your perspective on crisis. 
when written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters, danger and opportunity. And as a family business, during the COVID crisis, we address not just physical needs during uh, this, this past 24 months, but also the mental health needs of our employees and their families. And then we adapted our business to the new environment, focusing on contactless payment and control over, uh, over the price of the, what they pay at the pump. And uh, in the years that Jack and I have been married, we, we've lived through many storms, through financial pain as a family and not just survived, but thrived. The last advice that my wife and I would like to give you is this, that we have a God in heaven who wants us to have an abundant life. And that's so much more than in the area of money. In the midst of the storm, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 to 34, but seek first his, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. God is faithful. He doesn't promise a storm-free life, but he does promise that uh, to be there in the midst of it. He promises a life more than money, a relationship with him as our righteous Heavenly Father. And through him, we get our physical, mental well-being, satisfaction in our work, and love and joy in our relationships with family. If you are in the midst of a storm today, my hope is that you will look to seek his kingdom first. When you do, you will find peace and wisdom that is supernatural to help you through the storms, to help simplify your life, to work with your creditors, to live within your budget, and to pivot your career or business in this VUCA world. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Mr. Yu, that was an amazing um, set of tips. And you know, I think for many of us listening here, it's really, we wish we had a lot more time to be able to go deeper into these um, practical perspectives that you said. I wanted to open up with a question for you. And I, I'm sure the, the audience has a lot of questions. So let me remind the audience again, this webinar is for you. Please put your questions on the chat feature here on Zoom or on FB where you're watching. And for all those that are watching uh, and just joined us, we want to remind you that this whole webinar will actually be sent to you as a link, including the notes of the speakers. So just feel free to kind of screenshot what you find is uh, important to you at the moment, but everything else, you don't have to worry. They'll give it to you. Focus on asking questions that are relevant to you, which is what I'm going to do right now. Um, so Glenn, you know, we've known you for a number of years. We've, we've seen the journey, but there's a lot of refreshing things I heard from you. And even those tough moments, I didn't know that, you know, your parents were in a gas station and they worked there first. And that was part of your journey. But my question relates to when you talked about these, these cutbacks and the reality of many families that might even be experiencing or needing to do that right now. Um, my, my, my question is, bring us to the reality there. Which was your most difficult set of cutbacks as a family? And how did you help navigate through that? I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, when you, you let people go, I think that is really one of the toughest, toughest things that we've had to do as, uh, as an employer. And, um, uh, I, I, I still can remember the first person that I had to let go uh, during those tough times. And uh, I think it's, it's a reminder for us to be, um, you know, really disciplined in, in the way we manage our finances. Right. Uh, bring it to the family level. You, you said that, you know, it was difficult because you had to address your lifestyle. Uh, and cut back as a family, right? And, and as I was saying, mm -hmm. I think many families are needing to do that. So what was the most difficult cutback that you had to do as a family and how did you want to do that? You know, as a, a Filipino Chinese family, we love to eat. <laughs> so um, that's, that's probably why I mentioned in one of the slides, so one of the things that uh, we, we did was, you know, to make sure that we brought uh, home cooked food to the office instead of eating out. So that's one of the things we really had to um, be intentional about. So, and uh, I guess that's, 
uh, one of the things that, um, you know, our children growing up, they never really knew that we were cutting back because they were so young. Uh, so it's really more between Jack and myself and understanding uh, what it was um, that uh, we were giving up. Hmm. Thanks, man. Speaking of Filipino Chinese uh, backgrounds, my wife has that background. You have a question, honey? Yeah, I was just so inspired in the part where you talked about you reverted to the envelope system or you were encouraging people to do that. Because I remember when my husband and I also had to do that and we were so overspending on our credit cards. But one of the things that I was encouraged by was that my husband took the lead to really make sure that we did this as a family. But I, I wanna ask you that question because I know there are a lot of fathers here, a lot of men in the audience. How integral and how important is it for the husband or the father or the man to role model the principles that you talk to so that your wife and your children would embrace the same perspective instead of becoming entitled, which can happen in um, a family that, that does have wealth. Yeah. So. I in our family, we do our budgets at the beginning of the year, and we, uh, when we were starting out, there wasn't any uh, spreadsheet, but uh, uh, we we involved every member of the family uh, as it is almost like a family tradition to us when we do our budgets, and then uh, since we have access to that document or that spreadsheet, then we can hold each other accountable when we're uh, not walking our talk and uh, that's happened uh, uh, more than once in our family especially given that now that we have grown children and they they're aware now of uh, um, our spending habits as well that they they often uh, would call us out and say hey dad I thought our budget for this is uh, just this amount how come this month you overspent and I think that's that's useful that you involve the family in this exercise, and it's not just something that uh, you do on behalf of the family, because as you mentioned, it can create a sense of entitlement if they're not involved. Hmm. That's so great. I think that we're going to have more questions lined up for you as we move along, but we're going to go to the next speaker now, Hun. Right, and we will ask once again the... Um the champion and the prime mover for this family first global movement and this webinar. Professor Slayton, the floor is yours. See, this is so good. We can learn from each other. I've just learned something important. I mean, I wrote a book on fatherhood, but the idea of doing a family budget, getting your kids involved, honestly, we haven't really done that. And that's a great, great, great idea. So that's super. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm learning a lot here, and I know I'm going to learn from our next and last speaker, Hans Helmrich, because I've known Hans, and he's been uh, a dear, dear friend, like Mark and like Glenn, for a long time. Hans is an inc another incredibly successful uh, uh, Christian man. He's the uh, chairman of Helmrich and Payne. Uh, Helmrich and Payne of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is uh, a huge company. It's a New York Stock Exchange company. It's the largest provider of land drilling services in the entire United States. Has a market cap of about $2.5 billion. Uh, Hans was also a board member of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, which is a really big deal in the United States. And he was a trustee of Northwestern Mutual Life among a whole bunch of others. But what I love about Hans is he's not just about making money, he's really served his community, Tulsa, extremely well. He's been uh, current or past chairman of the Boy Scouts of America, the Tulsa Community Foundation, and many, many others. Hans, like uh, Mark and myself, graduated from Dartmouth College. He completed his uh, uh, Harvard Business School's program for management development. He's married to Leah. They have five children and get this, nine grandchildren. And uh, again, like, like each of, like all of our speakers, Hans is a guy I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and I know we're going to learn from. So Hans, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really looking forward to, uh, to listening to you and learning from you. Well, thank you, and it's an honor to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity. It's been enjoyable for me to listen to our other panelists and, and speakers, and I've known Greg for a long time, and he's been a real blessing to my life. Yeah, I, I would 
almost like to give some time back to Mark and Glenn and hear more about it, but we will have a chance for more Q and A together. So my first slide talks about an important aspect that has been really helpful in um, my life. And if we could go to the, the find mentor slide, I'm gonna talk about creativity in a little bit. Okay, perfect. So in finding mentors, I want you to just imagine for a second, if you were in the room alone with Glenn and Mark, and if you had a chance to visit with, with Greg, just in terms of a relationship and a mentoring opportunity and, and a chance to, in this same format, but it's just you with, what I've seen in my life is God is a relational God and he puts a priority on relationships and then he builds relationships into our lives. Uh, Mark's mom and dad, we've heard Glenn talk about family and that's been true for me. So, you know, one of the key relationships and opportunities I had to learn was working with my dad. We worked together for over 32 years. I had a chance when I first started to work with my grandfather in the business. But I have had a chance to, to interact with wise, godly men and have a chance to ask them about the things we're talking about. What were you thinking when you bought your first house? How, how did you decide uh, about the best way to, to save money? What was, what was your thought when you were young about beginning to make a plan to pay for college for the kids. Having conversations. I, I have a chance today. Uh, it's a real joy for me to mentor some, some people. And it's surprising in a way that when I will talk about these types of things and just a conversation around finances, how often they'll say, you know, I've never talked about this to another person. You know, besides my spouse, I, I've never gotten any advice about some of the priorities or some of the things we, we should be thinking about. So it's just a telling thing. And I think one of the things that happens is, and in particular with finances, I think the enemy tries to say to us, oh, you have to be an island unto yourself. You have to pull back and isolate. And then it can even be, darker than that. It can be, oh, you earn this money. You don't have to get anyone's permission. Uh, you're the boss. This is money that you've earned. It, it's a very sinister way to try to isolate us and uh, take us out of relationships. So my first advice to everyone on our, our call today is find godly men and women that you can have real conversations with and have a chance to hear some of the things we've been hearing tonight. I love the scripture that says, the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. That's in Proverbs. And I think it's just so true that God wants to build relationships around our life. You know, there's a slide if we could go to about debt, but I'm only going to spend a couple of moments on it because we've heard some good things about debt and about uh, some of the dangers involved. You know, I'm in an industry, and Glenn talked about this too in the energy business. We are very cyclical. We see prices go very high, very low. Right now, we're in a high price uh, environment, but it's just so hard to predict. We don't know the future. We serve a God that knows the future, but we can't tell what the future is. And almost invariably, the industry has over levered in good times and paid a terrible price in bad times. And that not only pertains to businesses, it, it happens in our family because the world's message is, oh, you can have it all now. You can have it all now. And there's easy credit. We can arrange low interest. Oh, you can get an extra credit card. Uh, and it's true in the business world that banks are your best friends when things are going well and they want to loan you money. You even have celebratory dinners around. And I, I would go to a couple of those and think, wow, we're celebrating because we're borrowing money. Uh, that doesn't seem 
that doesn't seem right. But when the difficult times come and you have to pay it off, it's less friendly at that time and it's more serious. So that's really what I want to say about debt with just one other comment is the Bible says that the borrower is the servant of the lender. In another place, it talks about the borrower is like a slave. But what we know is we're not servants and slaves. We're sons and daughters to the king. And by being in debt, it tends to put us in a mindset of being a servant and a slave. So I would just encourage you, put the effort into reducing and then finally with a plan of, of being out of debt. Okay, if we can go to the next slide on just generational legacy. I was blessed by Mark talking about his mom. Uh, Mark, my mom's 94 as well. And it's hard sometimes right now. And a lot of us said that we have some debt and, and that's fine. It's just, I hope we can think about it differently. A lot of us have had, talked about having difficulty with budgeting and trying to make it work sometimes week to week, month to month. But I'm convinced that God wants to give us a generational legacy in the way we think about our finances. He wants to, even if you're not in a place yet to act on that, he wants to, you to think about how do I bless my kids and my kids' kids? Uh, I, I love the scripture that says God's loving kindness extends to our children's children and that his plans and his heart uh, is stands forever through all generations. God is a generational God. He, he calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he wants us to be thinking generationally. The calling on everyone's life on this call is a generational calling. And it impacts your life and God's going to walk you through those purposes, but it also extends to your kids. And I would say your kids' kids. We benefited from our parents and we have an opportunity to bless, just like Abraham was promised, bless the nations through our legacy thinking. And finances can be a tool for that. You know, the last thing I want to say about this is just the joy of giving and partnering in the kingdom and it doesn't have to be in a big way it can be in small ways the first way we partner is in having real relationships with brothers and sisters that we're praying for that we are joining together hey a real joy in my life with with my friendship with the ambassador is the partnering around what god has called him to do and and just in making uh, small contributions, I feel like we are in God's kingdom work together. God is working. He's calling each of us to work. And I love that thought that we get to enter into another man's labor. Jesus talks about that. If you remember, and he says that the sower and the reaper will work together the, the reaper will even overcome the sower. it's like this coming together because in god's kingdom through relationships we have this chance to partner together and i'm encouraging us to think about our finances as a tool to do that to to work and respond to god's calling to partner in the kingdom you know my last slide is on creativity and you, you might think well what what is a slide on creativity being here but i really believe that god is uniquely gifted all of us god is a creative god i love when he says i'm about to do a new thing and it'll spring forth will you be able to perceive it god has given each of us a creative gift that helps us find solutions in your world. So in your job, in your family, he will give you ideas and a new perspective on ways to be creative. And, and the market pays for solution. The market pays for a 
create a fix. Hey, it's, it's easy to go to the boss and say, hey, boss, we have a problem. But it's not so easy to say, hey, boss, we have a problem, and I have an idea. I think we can fix this. One of the great traits of our company is the innovation that is part of our culture and our value system. My granddad, who started the company 102 years ago, he would not recognize the drilling rigs that we put out in the field today. And your grandfather wouldn't recognize the phone you use or the car you drive. If he went to the doctor's office with you, he wouldn't recognize that. Why is that? Because creative solutions, innovations drive a sense of wealth and God's blessing. And so I just am going to encourage you. And you might say, well, I'm not in a workplace. I'm in the home. I love watching my daughter, who learned from her mother, my beautiful wife of almost 42 years, I love watching her come up with new things to do and new ways to teach her kids and new activities around the home. So she is being creative and coming up with new solutions. I, I, I love the, the, the example of a beehive. And think about it just for a second. You know, a beehive is this complex system. And some bees are, they bring air into the hive and other bees are exhaust bees. There are honey bees, there are queen bee, every, bees have a role. But that role is exactly the same as it was yesterday. And they're gonna do the exact same thing tomorrow and a year from now. They were doing it a thousand years ago. But that's not how God designed us. God designed us to be people that can walk into our environment, change the atmosphere, be positive, come up with an idea. And what I like about this is the market will pay for you. God will promote that type of solution driven thinking. So that's why creativity is, is on here. Uh, my, my favorite scripture about wealth and finances is something that Glenn already mentioned, uh, but I'm going to go up a little further in Matthew chapter six, where he says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. And so what I want to end on is I think the enemy tries to bring fear into our financial understanding. I think he tries to come against us with a message of fear. And God's saying, consider the lilies. I'm going to take care of you. Uh, even in the unknown times ahead, I'm going to be your rock and your sure place. So I, I hope that's helpful. And I'd love to take some questions. And I've enjoyed being with everybody tonight. Oh, that was so encouraging. And I think, you know, after listening to the three of you and your perspectives and where you guys are at and how God has blessed you, I think sometimes we can look at you and think, how are we ever going to get to that state or that status? But I think what you pointed out, which is so amazing, is that that may not be what God has called us to. And God has a unique calling for all of us. And so can you expound a little bit more on how we can have that courage to keep going when things don't seem to be going our way. Let's say God has put a calling, a uniqueness in each of us. And instead of comparing, he wants us to pursue that, but it gets hard when there are a lot of issues and problems that we face. So how do you, um, how can you encourage somebody to keep going, even though it seems like everything is against them as they pursue this vision or calling or uniqueness that God has uh, ordained for them? Yeah, it, it's, it's a great, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that God speaks to us and he speaks to us oftentimes a, a word of, of encouragement or uh, a, a word uh, that like you're suggesting joy that, Hey, you can do this. You can keep going. And, and so part of what, we can do, I believe, is think through, well, how does God speak? And, and I, I know 
some things I can suggest. You know, one is just esteeming his word more and getting in the word more because God will speak a rhema word to us that really it comes out of the logos word, but it becomes life to us and real and a rhema word for the moment. The other thing I know because it's happened in my life so many times is God has used a relationship in my life to encourage me or give me an insight or a, have you thought about this? Why don't you try this? And it's been life changing. And I, I can just think of so many times where I think even to that person, it doesn't, didn't seem like that big a deal, but it was a big deal to me. And I'm certain now that it was a setup, that it was the spirit of God putting them in the right place and me having the benefit of, of that relationship. So, you know, those are, those are a, a couple of things that come to mind, but it, I think also we not only hear his voice, but Joy, when you said sometimes it just feels discouraging, you know, we have another voice that we have to contend with. And Jesus talked about it. You know, Jesus talked about not only being able to hear his father and do what his father says. He said, I only say what he says and I can only go and do what he tells me to do. But he also talked about another voice and, and that voice was the enemy's discouragement. And the enemy is so often trying to discourage us and, and to tell us something that we're not or treat us. And, you know, I, I like that saying that um, the enemy knows our name, but he calls us by our sin. God knows our sin, but he calls us by our name. And we need to discern the enemy's voice so we can say, you know what, I'm just not going to listen to that. I'm not going to give that room. I'm not going to give that mind space. So those would be a couple of things I would recommend. Thank you, Mr. Helmerich. Um, you know, I wanted to jump in with one question before we invite all the other panelists back. And as expected, we have a flurry of questions, a lot of different ones for all of you. And we're excited to unpack that with all of you. But one question from me for you, you know, part of what impacted me with your story, Mr. Helmerich, is the fact that you've had generational wealth and you talked about legacy and generations passing that on. Um, my, my question is on a, on a deeply personal note, did you ever feel pressure to be able to carry that on? And, and if ever you did, how did you deal with that? Because there are families that may be listening here that are also in the same situation, right? Their parents have been able to do something and now it's something that they're passing on. So, so speak to that. Yeah, I, I, I'll try to. And, and Ed, Edric, I think something that was life-changing for me is when I very first started to work, my dad, my grandfather, who started the company, was still coming to work in a suit and tie, and he would get there at 7. And I wasn't very smart, but I thought, if he's going to get there at 7, I'm going to get there at 6.45 or 6.50. And we had a chance to have coffee and, and, and visit. And, and spend some time together. Well, I didn't know then that in less than nine months, he would pass away. So that time with him was really important. And I can remember standing by his bedside and thinking to myself, hey, everything he did that I'm so proud of, everything that the world kind of acknowledges and some of the money that he made and some of all of those accomplishments don't matter now. The only thing that matters right this moment is his relationship with God. The only thing that is important now for the next thousand, million, hundred million years in eternity is that, thankfully, God is a friend of sinners and Jesus came to save, to seek and save the lost. And, and so here's why I say that it sets your priorities in a certain way. And, and then it makes you feel like, wow, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad I have a chance to work with the company, but the company is not the most important thing in the world. You know, I'm glad I have a chance to have some of these opportunities and benefits, but these aren't the most important thing. And so the most important thing is kind of what Joy said, what did God call me to? What is my purpose? And then how can I hear him speak into my life in a way where I have an opportunity to walk that out and make the choices that, that help facilitate that. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Helmrich. And you know, just like the other panelists, as I mentioned, I have 100 billion questions. So now is the time to do that. We will invite the other panelists back on the call. So Mr. Yu, Mr. Belton, it has been a privilege just learning from you in this short time. And really that's what it is. When we talk about a massive uh, you know, topics and the implications of it surrounding money, there's really so much to, to talk about. So honey, I think you wanna jump in with the first question from one of our viewers, go ahead. Right, I think one of the questions that was fielded, but I'll rephrase it a little, but it was, if there is one hindsight um, probably concept on finance, finance that you believe changed um, you 180 degrees, not not 360, <laughs> 180 degrees over the years, what would that be? But I'll rephrase the question and any of you guys can jump in to ask it. But if you could tell your younger self something about money management, what would that be? And any of you can jump in to answer this. I think probably the first thing I would tell myself is to get alignment you know, with your wife. You know, there's so much struggle that happens in this area when you're not on the same page. And, uh, you know, and everyone around this table can honestly, if we're being honest, we'll say there've been times we haven't been on the same page. And when you're not, it just creates, it creates a level of stress that's beyond the problem itself. I just have a quick follow-up question to that, uh, and I hope you don't mind. You know what, you're, you're talking about the perspective of a husband, but what about for the wives out there? What What is it about your wives that you felt was supportive and was encouraging to allow you to go out there and do the things that you had to do? Because it's a two-way thing, right? It's, it's also the encouragement that we can do as wives. So how did your wife play that very supportive, encouraging role in your life? And maybe that could speak to the women who are listening as well. Um, I, I think, you know, first and foremost, your, your wife, for me, my wife is my best friend. And when your wife is your best friend, you share your whole life with them. You share your whole set of dreams with them and you receive their dreams. And, you know, as she shares her dreams, you put them together, you know, and work toward those. Um, you know, with your hands together with each other, holding on to God, moving forward toward the promise. And, um, and you know, interestingly enough, when, when we got married, our minister told us to create a, um, a family um, mission statement. And we created a mission statement before we got married and actually put it on the back of our wedding program to tell people what we thought God was telling us to do and how we should live. Great response. And thanks for that follow-up question, honey. I have to say that you are my best friend as well. And maybe we should do our mission statement, just like what we heard. Can we ask uh, Mr. Yu, what would you tell your younger self? Uh, well, not to put your life on pause when you find yourself in a financial crisis and uh, um, uh, reflecting on, you know, uh, the 1997 Asian financial crisis, I was actually thinking we need to uh, dig ourselves out of debt and we need to do all these um, bunch of things before I focus on, um, you know, <laughs> fast forwarding uh, through life and maybe finding a life partner and maybe uh, uh, changing that mindset and taking a risk. Uh, and sharing with someone who is not your wife and you, the person that you might be interested in as God's best for you, letting her know that, uh, you know, times are tough, but maybe uh, if she wants to persevere through that, that uh, uh, we could uh, do it together. So that's probably what I would share. Thanks, Glenn. And, you know, there was about 19% singles in this call. So this is a, a move that you want to do also before and as as. Glenn or Mr. Yu was sharing. Thank you for that response. Mr. Helmrich, what would you tell your younger self? That's oh, a great question. I, I, I think I would say worry less, be less anxious, and try to step back and have a higher horizon point. You know, we, we kind of look down at what is in front of us that seems so large and, and 
troublesome and we don't kind of look up and and that's the thing about having a, a faith in a god who's in control and who still sits on the throne even in the most difficult even in the most difficult times and, and so he'll give us a you know the carnal mind can just not understand spiritual things but he'll give us an understanding on what really is important and i would say to to young couples of what you you've already heard is don't let money be a wedge or or a source of division and your marriage and your strength is going to be such a gift not only to yourselves but to your children and then later to your grandchildren i, I know for some young people and single people they, oh, I'm not, that's not where i am well but there's a calling on your life and you're young and uh the years go fast so i i would just say i would tell my younger self do you have your priorities right are you are you seen through the eyes uh, of the world or are you seeing a higher horizon point that's great advice and, I, and on that note uh, another question from our viewers here and this i think is a very real one even as you encourage us to keep our horizons higher there are some very real practical uh, concerns that need to be addressed. So here's a question for all of you gentlemen. Uh, the question is, how do I start saving even when my wages are not increasing? Yet my expenses are adding on daily, even with tight purse strings. And I can imagine that the person asking this question is, is really quite stressed right now and is looking for some practical relief. Any thoughts on how to address that? Uh, Glenn, Mr. Yu, would you like to go first? Because you did some cutbacks as you shared earlier? I think uh, the first step is to find out uh, what is the shortfall. Because uh, once you've articulated that, and I'm, I'm gonna be very practical here. Once you know that, uh, you know, you're, sh you're short a thousand pesos a month, then at least you, you have a starting point. And uh, you, can, you can work your way through uh, your, your list of, uh, your sources of income and your expenses that way. And uh, hopefully it will turn out that you're able to balance uh, your budget. Um, if you're single, uh, then one of the largest uh, uh, expense items is, uh, you know, you, you're, if you're paying rent. I know uh, many people have uh, decided, especially during this time of COVID, to go back to uh, their, the province and live with their family. And that cuts down uh, expenses uh, by a whole lot. So, you know, by, uh, by doing uh, certain specific things, hopefully, you know, they're able to balance their budget. Okay. Um, Mr. Helmers, did you want to jump in and give some practical thoughts as well? So, you know, they want to save, but expenses keep piling up and they're trying their best to keep everything tight. I mean, what practical advice can you help them um, use? Well, I, it's, it's a good question. And, you know, I, I know I, I've said in our business before where we've had to really cut back and try to economize, you know, we can't cut our way to success. I mean, we can't just work down the nub uh, to where you're not only cutting flesh, but you're cutting bone. And so then it, it gives you an opportunity to kind of step back. And, and one of the things we're fortunate about in this marketplace is what we're making. And, and that's why I mentioned just the creativity and is there a way God can, can give us new ideas to do different things. But one of them is, and I've, I've counseled people in, in this regard is maybe your employer is sending you a message with your pay that says, Hey, I, maybe I should step back and, and look for something else. Uh, maybe there are other opportunities out there. I, I can tell you in several conversations in the last six months, investors and business people I know think, hey, one of the real pinch points is going to be labor going forward. And, and good people that you can trust, that have integrity, that tell the truth. And so if we bring those things as Christians, then we should be valuable to an employer and Maybe the, the problem is on the other side of the equation. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not discounting or saying don't, don't cut back. And I also like 
the idea of even if it's a small amount of savings, even if it seems like it doesn't even matter. And I would say that too with your generosity and giving. Even if you can't tithe right now, give something. Get in a motion of giving something. Save something. Uh, so those, those are uh, some ideas, Edric. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Belton, you want to jump in? Yeah, you know, I think I would pick up on both what Glenn and, and Hans have said in different parts of their presentation. I would sit across the table from a mentor or a spiritual father and actually talk through that budget with someone else. Um, I've just found a lot of times when I sit down and talk with someone else about something, I hear myself. And often when I hear myself, solutions come because you're actually it's more active and it's going back and forth so i think you know number one spend some time and talk this through with someone you trust and and very often you'll get a solution there you know i think glenn said pivot you know around areas that you might need to rethink that you thought were sacred cows but maybe aren't so sacred anymore like finding a roommate moving back home find another job you know there are lots of options but you need to talk it through with someone, get some wisdom with someone else. Thank you, Mr. Belton. Now, before we go to the next question, you know, part of the, the wisdom I also gleaned from another gentleman in another webinar is also repurposing your assets, right? If you are, are tight and you have expenses to pay and you know, you're, you're looking for other income streams, there may be things that you can actually literally sell to help cover expenses, right? Things that you can use in different ways so it can become an added income stream for you kind of along the lines that the gentleman shared here. So that, that might be a way to look at it also. Expenses are piling up and, you know, you, you feel really tight. Then you need to unlock uh, more of the income stream. So thank you again for the wisdom, gentlemen. Joy, honey, you have a question from a viewer. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to, um, to add to what Mr. Belton was saying, that if you're looking for mentors, this is a great place to start because uh, family First Global is here for that very reason. They want to help you guys, not just in your family relationships, but also in these different areas that they're, you know, giving seminars and talks about because that's their burden. So if you're wondering, because there was a question here, where do we start when it comes to looking for mentors and people whom we can trust? And I'd like to assume, um, Professor Slayton, that this is the very place where you can find people who will walk alongside you as you journey and, you know, have these challenges that you're facing. Uh, now on to a more practical question that was also fielded, and maybe, maybe uh, Mr. You can answer this, but the question is, is there ever a time when debt is good debt? And you can be speaking from, I mean, you obviously you guys are, are, you're coming from a perspective where these are massive companies, but on a practical level in the day-to-day -day life of an average, per, average person, is there ever a time when, when debt is good debt? And that's the question that was asked. Yeah, I think uh, in, in several uh, circumstances, uh, debt can be good. And I see uh, Mark nodding his head because uh, I remember him mentioning it also in his uh, presentation. Um, if, it, if you're taking on uh, uh, a purchasing a home, as an example, uh, and putting in equity in your home, uh, then that would be a, a good opportunity as well to consider uh, taking a mortgage on that property. Uh, and why, why would I say that this would be good debt? Uh, is that it's something that uh, at least uh, uh, in normal circumstances will appreciate over time. So it's not something that you're, uh, say, buying a car and using uh, borrowed money uh, to buy a car that doesn't work after five years. When you take a mortgage on a house, um, after 10, 20, 25 years, the, the value of that property is probably double, triple what, you're, what you paid for in the beginning. So that might be an opportunity that you would consider. Thank you. I think that question was answered uh, very well. So, Han, we can move on to the, to the next one. Yeah, so I think part of the questions we're also hearing here have to do with children, right? Um, you know, we've talked a lot about aligning with your spouse and a large part of what you learn from your parents and how this is vital. Uh, could you speak to the families here with children and, and how you get them involved in the discussions about money? In, do you actually think it's wise to involve them in any of the planning for the family's finances? Uh, do you think it's important that they know the realities? Uh, you know, for example, Glenn mentioned earlier that the kids did not experience the cutbacks 
you know, it was really the parents doing it. So speak to that in a time like this, how is it best to engage your children on the financial journey or in financial matters? Mr. Helmet, did you want to go first? Well, yeah, I'll try. You know, I, I think that the family is the right place. And I think God designed the family to train up children to have important conversations like this and to introduce them to well, here, here's some of the challenges or the, some of the things that, that we're working through. So I, I think that's, uh, that's appropriate. You know, I, I also think that I think of young couples and what we invest in our kids in terms of communicating values, the importance of telling the truth, uh, what, why integrity is important, um, all the different character traits that then become a platform for the, the rest of their lives. That is not only important, but it's so unique today in this world because we have so many broken families, so many absent fathers. We have so many situations where there are missing conversations about important things. And, and, and one of the real skills that young people don't develop is not so much around IQ, but around EQ. How do you get, how do you get along with people? How do you work as a team? How do you listen and don't feel like you have to talk all the time, but get good ideas from other people. And in a business environment, there are a lot of smart people that blow themselves up. Uh, they might have great IQ, but they have terrible people skills. They have terrible EQ. And we are uniquely in a position as believers to impart some of those important values to our kids. And, and just what we think is simple things, just caring for people, being kind to people, um, helping people, make other people a success around you. So th there are a lot of things, you, and that's why I would, I would say to people uh, that thought I had an important job and made a lot of money and you know, all, 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 of, all of that, I said, hey, my wife is raising five kids. Her impact on the kingdom and her impact on the generational blessing that we want to leave is a lot more important today than what I did at the office today. And, and I, just, I think we shortchange the laboratory of our families for raising kids that God will have an important calling on. Hmm. You're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Helmich. I have some good news and bad news for everybody here. The bad news is that's all the time we have for the questions, but the good news is uh, there will be an opportunity for Family First to actually reach out to you and possibly contextualize this in your regions because this topic is, as you can see from the various conversations here, very broad and very real to many people. And there are so many questions which are still going now. So that's the good news. In the meantime, we're going to ask each of our panelists now to please wrap up with some parting thoughts. Um, let's go the reverse order we started off with and have Mr. Helmerts go first, Mr. Yu, and close with Mr. Belton. So just parting thoughts, one or two liners to leave people with after the various discussions and things we've heard. Mr. Helmerts, please. Okay, well, I, I will just uh, encourage people to build relationships. And you might say, well, I don't have a mentor but I wish I did. How do I get a mentor? First of all, I think you pray about it and just say, God, I believe that you have people that you want to speak into my life and help me wreck. And, and a w one way to do it is oftentimes something that you're gifted in, you recognize that same gift in someone else. And they may be older and more experienced and more wise. And if you would approach them and say, I see something in you that I admire very much. Could I buy you a cup of coffee? I would just dare you to try that because my guess is you'll be surprised how often people are willing to say, yes, I'd be happy to visit with you. I'd be happy to answer your questions and you know, I'd be happy to help. So I just want to encourage people that uh, relationship building, 
is, is important, not only in this subject, but in so many things that God has called us to. And I have very much enjoyed being with everybody. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Mr. Helmrich. Uh, so much wisdom. Mr. Yu. I just wanted to encourage uh, everyone on the call uh, this morning. If you're finding yourself in the midst of that storm, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, God is there. And uh, sometimes the first thing we need to do is to acknowledge uh, that uh, we are not God. And it's, uh, there are certain things that outs are outside of our control. And uh, we need to surrender that and lift that up. And uh, when we do, uh, and speaking from my own personal experience, then he will give us the grace, he will give us the wisdom, he will give us the peace to go through that storm. So um, excited uh, at uh, the learnings uh, on the call. Thank you uh, for um, inviting uh, myself and uh, uh, truly I learned a lot also from Hans and uh, from Mark. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Indeed, in a VUCA world, in the term used earlier, right? Our lives will not be storm free, but they can be storm proof with God. Thank you for reminding us of that. Mr. Belton, please. Yes, you know, I just say the interesting thing about all three presentations today were that in each of them, in one way or another, we all had one scripture that was the same. And that scripture was seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. And the all things are not all material things, it's all things, the good in life, the joy in life, the peace in life, the power, the perseverance, the endurance to live in what you would call this VUCA world. We need it all. And, uh, and I guess, you know, uh, there was a commercial that, that, that's run in America all the time. And they say, don't leave home without it, American Express. I'll tell you right now, don't leave here without him. Hmm. Excellent. God bless you all. Thank you so much. What a privilege it is. Man. Let's appreciate all of our speakers once again. You can put your emoticons on the chat if you want, whichever, wherever you're watching from. Honey, let's formally close. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think one of the things that I admire about each of you, um, beyond the fact that you guys are very successful in the fields God has called you to, is you, you are successful at home. And that's such a rare combination. And I think that as we close, there's going to be a next seminar um, for, with Family First Global called Raising a Resilient Generation in a Fragile World. So what a great way to take off from the things that you guys said, that family is really the center that God has called us to, where we're supposed to disciple our families, disciple our kids. And in this day and age, when it comes to dealing with crisis, how do we raise them to be resilient um, and to go the distance? And so please stay tuned for that. Um, and I want to invite you all to check out Family First Global's website and learn more about what they are doing. This is great. We totally need this in this day and age. And you can also refer to your local chapters, Family First Global local chapters, for more information as well. Awesome. So thank you guys for joining us before you sign off. We need your help in making this better. You know, the greatest room in the world is the room for improvement. So we have a quick poll for you all. Please just uh, join this poll as you wrap up and, you know, we'll have our panelists say goodbye to all of you and you guys can turn your screens on and your audio on. So you can also say goodbye to our speakers. If you appreciated this free webinar for you, here are the quick questions. Number one, please be honest with us. How would you read, <coughs> excuse me. How would you rate this webinar? The options are there. Number two, how likely are you to join the next one, which uh, my wife Joy already shared. It's very exciting. And the third final question very quickly is, what topics are you interested in? We want to be able to serve you. FFG wants to be able to serve you. So this is very helpful for them. Thank you for filling in the poll. As you do, we're now going to call all the panelists to please come back on and our, our champion behind this, Professor Slayton, who will just wave to all of you and thank you guys. Please fill in that poll as you go. Once again, goodbye to everyone. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Feel free to pop on your videos and your audio to also thank our speakers whom I'm sure you've learned great things from just as we have. So thank you once again to the FFG team. Thank you to Professor Slayton, to our speakers and to all of you.